Um, it's not really just crime fiction that I really want to talk about. What I really want to talk about is really my journey and how I became a writer, because it was really interesting. I got out of Bethnal Green Overland Station and I walked down Vanance Road, I walked down Whitechapel High Street, and this high street has really, really changed, because I used to live in Watney for years as well. And I just noticed how many eateries there were, and I thought, my gosh, I can come back here and just eat my way along Whitechapel High Street. And then I saw this amazing building, because the idea store wasn't there when I was growing up, but Whitechapel Library was just seminal in me becoming a writer. So I kind of want to take you all the way back to the 60s. And we came to live in um, Town Hamlets in 1969. And we ended up living on the Burner Estate. I don't know if people know the Burner Estate. It's one street up from Cable Street. And I said to my dad, um, did you get any other offers? Because, you know, back in the day, people used to get offered a flat and you chose which one. And he said, yeah, they, are, they also showed us a flat in Brick Lane. I wasn't so sure about it, but I liked this flat. And it was a really big three-bedroom flat. But, you know, back, back then, the estate we lived on was, it was, it was a very poor estate. But I look back with pride on that estate because to tell you the truth, if I hadn't grown up there, I wouldn't be standing here today. So my parents came from a small island in the Caribbean called Grenada. Can you hear me? Because there's lots of noise. Do you want me to use the mic? Or can you hear me all right? Yeah? A small island called Grenada in the Caribbean. There's only 100,000 people on Grenada. And both my parents left school before they were 16. My mum was just turning 16 when she came to England, so she was definitely out of education. And my dad left school, I think, when he was about 13, and he was a fisherman before he came to um, England. And most of the Grenadian community, when they come to England, they end up usually living in Notting Hill, the Shepherd's Bush, but a lot of my family already based in, they were based in Forest Gate, and other people were based on the um, the Mylands and a lot of them lived on the Ocean Estate and we lived on the Burner Estate and one of the things my parents were passionate about and I think a lot of Grenadians are very passionate about is education. Education is just absolutely key. So what my mum used to make sure we did, because I went to Harry Gosling school, I should mention that, Harry Gosling, she used to make sure me, my sister and my two brothers and I was the youngest we used to go off to Whitechapel Library. And my mum never used to come with us. She never used to come with us. And I'm, see, I'm very interested in education because I spent a long time in education and I'm still heavily involved in education. It's the perception sometimes that educators have of what working class families should be doing. And you know, our mum not coming to the library with us didn't actually disadvantage us in any way. Our mum actually saying, you need to go and get some books you need to be educated. That was enough for us. And I grew up in a household where there was hardly any books. I had, I remember an atlas, I got that on my 11th birthday from my uncle. My uncle came to live with us when he was 16. He came down from Sheffield. My mum had a Bible, which she used to take out and read. And she used to take out her hymn book, which she used to take out and sing along when Songs of Praise came on. And my dad, my dad only used to read the the Sun and the now defunct news of the world. It took him years to move him off the Sun, but he eventually did. But that was the reading material in, 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 in my house. So my mum kind of figured out pretty early on, there's a big building not far from here with, I think, all the books my children will need, and I just make sure my children need to get access to that. Because that's a big thing for me, is the whole thing about who gets access to what in the society we live in. So we used to go off to Whitechapel Library. What my mum never used to figure out was we used to sneak in to Whitechapel Art Gallery as well. So we had this fabulous education of books and all this fabulous free art. And I don't know if people remember the Whitechapel Art Gallery. It is like that now. The, the artists that they used to display, the works that they used to display. And I remember recently I did um, an interview with a journalist from um, one of the leading national papers. And I told her this bit of my story. She said to me, and I did think she was being very patronizing, I didn't say anything to her. She said, 
you've done so well considering there were no books in your house. And I thought you've missed the point of the story completely. I don't need books in my house when there's this fabulous building called Whitechapel Library um, around the corner. So we used to go there and what we used to love was, I don't know, does everyone remember Whitechapel Library? Yes. Fabulous architecture. And I didn't realise at the time that it was considered to be the university of the community, that lots of people used to go to the Whitechapel Library and kind of educate themselves, radicalise themselves. And upstairs of this fabulous building was this whole music and language collection. So it was a real outing for us. And it's interesting because all of us, my, myself, my brothers and my sister, were all very much interested in music, we're all interested in art, we're all interested in culture. And we can talk about it as well. Although I'm the only one of my brothers and sisters who actually went to university. Because I've got this whole thing about um, success not being just filtered through university. There are other routes to success as well. So I just love books. I've got the Whitechapel Library. And at the same time, in my house, my dad, who left school before he was 16, was just a fantastic storyteller. That man could tell a story. And usually these stories were really exaggerated. And it made the telling of them so much more better. And um, my dad, a lot of his friends used to come around on a Friday night and they used to play dominoes. And I don't know if everyone's seen black guys play dominoes. And it's not this very sedate thing, it's this real bang, bang. And as they're banging, banging, they're telling these stories at the same time. And they also used to play drafts, and in the Caribbean, drafts is very different. You have flying kings, so they used to have these kings that used to be able to fly across the board and move certain amount of spaces. And we just used to sit there, and remember, you know, that was back in the day when kids used to sit on the floor a lot. And we used to just sit near the settees as these older guys were telling these stories. All these older people who left school before they were 16, and that's where I picked up the narrative about storytelling, the whole thing about um, character. And I never forget, my dad told the story, I can't remember the, what the story was about, but the character in this story was called Schoolboy. And I remember that name, and I thought, Schoolboy, Schoolboy, I like that name. And I remember burying it away deep in my head, thinking, I'm not sure, I know I'm going to use that name somewhere in the future. So, I have to say, and I'll be really honest, I did not get my love of storytelling and reading from going to school. I went to Harry Gosling School, it was a fabulous school, and I went to Bishop Challoner School, and Bishop Challoner was, was a fabulous school, but it was a very academic school, and I think it was very much geared up, if you were going to be academic, it was a great school for you, if you were, if, I don't think it was such a great place. Um, and the other thing I think about the school was it didn't really quite tap into all the types of education that were happening at home. So not once were my parents asked about the type of English they did with us. So not once were my parents ever able to say, well, we tell stories at home. We use storytelling in our home. So I didn't get my love of reading and writing um, from school at all. And then I started growing up, but I was very academic because I loved reading, I can't tell you. To now, I bring books with me. If I don't read a book every day, not a whole book, but read, I feel like I need a fix, you know? I really, really do. I've just got such a passion for reading because I just love escaping to other people's lives. And I think essentially I'm a very nosy person, I think, really at heart. So, growing up on the estate, and what I noticed was happening on my estate, tell me if you think I'm wrong here, but I felt... A lot of the girls that I grew up with, and a number of them became pregnant quite early on. They had their children when they were 16, 17, 18. But if I look at a lot of those women now, a lot of them will have somewhere along the line gone back into education, maybe part-time, in the evening. What I perceived happening around me for the young men I grew up with, some of them, was that didn't actually happen. That they actually would start truanting, end up in trouble, and very often they didn't go back into any kind of education at all. And I remember thinking about this, and it was another thing, I parked at the back of my head, because I used to think, what was going on here? What is going on? And then, I, you know, at school I had a fantastic history teacher, Miss Lewis. She could tell a story. She knew how to tell a story. 
And this was another seminal moment in my life. I remember I was 17, I was studying for my A-levels, and I walked into my school library. Now remember, this is a very traditional Catholic school, run by nuns, the head teacher is a nun. And I walked into the library, I went off to the bookshelves, and I remember doing a double take. And there was this book, it was a really thick book, but it had a picture of a black man on the front, wearing Napoleonic uniform, and it was called The Black Jacobins, written by somebody called C.L.R. James. And I thought, what's this book? So I took it off, and I was being a lover of history. I read the blurb, and it said it was telling me about this revolution, a slave revolution, in what is modern-day Haiti, at this kind of the same time that you had the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And I remember thinking, how is it no one has been telling me about this history at all? And it was just a real marker for me because I immediately, because I knew I was going to university, I wanted to study more. I went off to see my history teacher and I said, Miss, Miss Lewis, I want to study Caribbean or African history. That's what I want to do. I don't feel I know enough about it. And she was just such a modern thinker and she said, I know exactly the places that you should go. And in the end, I went off to the School of Oriental and African Studies, which sounds terribly flash, to study African history with a bit of Caribbean um, history. And then after I left, I went across to the Institute of Education to train to be a teacher because I realised I had a passion for teaching children, but teaching children in the inner cities. And I particularly wanted to teach you in Tahamlitz. So I went off and I actually started teaching history and I started teaching first in Barclay and Dagenham in um, 1988 and then at the same time, lucky me, Tower Hamlets had a shortage of teachers in primary schools and I remember writing to them and saying, I don't work for you currently, however I do live in a borough, I grew up here and I knew they had a retraining programme from secondary teachers to primary, can I join it? They asked me to come and see them and then they said, yeah, why not? And then I ended up teaching um, in Tower Hamlets. And I also, when I started teaching, I got an offer of a flat. Does everyone remember the days of hard to let flats? When you tell people about hard to let, everyone says, no, that couldn't have been. Hard to let flats were usually one bedroom flats that nobody else wanted apart from single people. And I remember being offered this flat in Wapping, if you can imagine this. A flat in Wapping, it didn't have a radiator in one room, so that was one of the reasons it was hard to let. In the kitchen, one of the cupboards was kind of hanging off. And I was the only person in the block who had my own balcony with a fabulous view of Tower Bridge. And nobody wanted this flat back in the, um, the early 90s. And I remember, when I moved into this flat, I had a bed, Thankfully there was a built-in wardrobe because I couldn't afford a wardrobe. I couldn't afford a settee. I could afford, back in the day when you could get a second-hand cooker, a second-hand fridge. I had a chair, a wooden chair. I had a black and white portable telly. And I had a hanger in the back, a wire hanger as the aerial. And that was my life. When I started teaching, I used to teach. And the only place I used to live was in my bedroom in the flat. I didn't have any other furniture. See, this to me is a really important part of my story, how I became a writer, because I think I learned from a, a really young age, from my parents, from living in my flat, that having oodles of money was not what success was about. Success was about striving for the things that you wanted. And also that things take time. I love the books and I always thought at the time I wanted to do something with books. However, I think I've got to establish my career in one profession and then maybe I can think about books later on. So I became a teacher, a deputy head teacher, was working my way up, worked in local authorities. And one day in 2001, I remember turning to my partner Tony, I said, you know what Tony, I really fancy doing a writing course because I'm going to learn about this thing called writing. And at the back of my head, was nothing to do with publishing at all. I just want to learn about the tools of writing fiction. And he said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Why don't you look for a course? I was very conscious I wanted to look for a book course. And this is literally how it happened. The next week, in a magazine, Time Out, 
back then they used to do not just advertising books that were coming out, but they used to advertise courses as well. And there was a course, and it was a beginner's course for fiction writing, run at a place called the Groucho Club in Soho. And I don't know if people know the Groucho Club, and it's um, history, it's reputation, but it's a place where all those celebs hang out. And usually you can only go if you're a member. And to be a member is very expensive and people don't get in. But it would say, no, you don't need to be a member. And I thought, oh my gosh, this might be the one. This might be the one. And I remember saying to a friend of mine, this was a really close friend of mine. She's still a close friend of mine. I said to her, I've seen what I think is a really good course. Before I ring up, what do you think I should do? So I told her about the course. I was excited. And what do you think my friend said to me? Anyway, what do you think my friend said to me? Yeah. She said to me, and these were exact words, they were printed on my brain, don't ring up, someone like you will never get in. And the someone like you is what East End girl, working class girl, went to a state school, parents left school before they were 16, you still live on a council estate now. You know, I still lived on a council estate until 10 years ago when I, when I moved to my house. And I thought, you know what? You're not going to say to me. It's the worst thing to say to me. Because I thought, you know what? I'm going to get in that course even if I have to climb through the window. You watch me. <laughs> and I rang up and I spoke to this woman who was the director of the course of author, Maggie Hammond. And she said to me, We've only got one space left. You sound like just what we need. And I thought, yeah. And I remember going off on that Saturday, getting on the tube, and I remember getting out of Leicester Square, coming into Soho, and all of a sudden, I felt really scared. And you know, my friends, it doesn't matter sometimes. You might put on a front, yeah, I'm really confident. But when people say things to you, they plant a seed of doubt. And as I'm walking through Soho, this seed of doubt is just growing and growing. And the doubt is saying, what is someone like you really go to the Groucho Club for? The place will be full of journalists, which it was, and you won't be able to write like those people. But I went through the doors, and I remember going like this to the people on the reception with my head down. Yeah, it's three the same you're here for the course. They said, oh, it's up the stairs. And I remember walking up the stairs like a tortoise with my head inside the shell. I didn't want anyone to notice me, don't notice me, I don't even think I'm worthy to be here all of a sudden. And I remember sitting in a corner, and, but then I realised, you've paid your money, just learn. And what I re hadn't realised was happening, was when I used to read at my work, Maggie, and I didn't know Maggie lived in Hackney, she thought, wow, this is really, really interesting. And then I left the course, then Maggie set up another course, so I went on that as well. And then Maggie set up her own publishing house called Maya Press, which she ran from her house in Hackney, her and somebody called Jane Havel, and they were only going to produce six books a year. And in Maggie's class, what I realised I wanted to write about was a character called Schoolboy, is Schoolboy, from my dad's story, and his name was Schoolboy because something had happened to him in education. He had started truancy and he had drifted into crime and become a drug dealer. And he was desperate to get out of the drug dealing business. And this was an important story to me because I had a friend who was very close to me. I can't tell you, my friend was so articulate, you know, he was so articulate. And in terms of brain power, a lot more brainier than me if you want to use words like brainier. And his mum made the mistake, I'm not going to mention the school, sending him to a very strict Catholic boys' school in Tower Hamlets. And he was a musician. We went to the same primary school. And my primary school, the one thing it was great at was music. We were in the choir. Back in the day, the Inner London Education Authority felt that all children should have a musical instrument. So we had guitars at home. My sister had a violin. My friend just could play any music going. And he went to this Catholic boys' school. They were only interested in academic achievement. There was no music. He got bored. By the second year, he was truanting, got involved in drugs. Before he knew it, he was in detention centre. The next time we heard, he was in Bristol, and then it was with the big guys in, 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 in prison. 
And I remember meeting him, um, this is a long time ago, and he looked really rough. And he had got hooked on crack, and crack is just so destructive. And I really felt scared for him, I felt scared for him here. And I was worried that the next time I would hear about him, he would be dead, because other people we know had died. And he actually managed to take that step of getting out. And he said to me, the problem was not being in prison, as everyone tells you. The problem is coming out, meeting your mates again, getting back into the same environment and cycle. And he made the move and was able to get into a fabulous rehab place outside of London. And, you know, he's been clean for 14 years now. And he's very clear. He doesn't think he'll live back in London. He comes back. But he's happy where he is, and being the enterprising guy that he is, he started his music again, he started acting again. And he was the springboard for my character, Schoolboy. And I was very clear when I was writing my book, and I decided to call this book Running Hot, because that was a word I'd heard years ago, when people were after you, you were running hot on the streets. I didn't want my character to have a bad ending. I was sick to death of reading literature about young black guys in particular. What happens to them? Oh gosh, they end up back in prison. What happens to them? Oh gosh, they end up dead. That was not going to happen to schoolboy. So I know I've told you the ending. <laughs> but it really is his journey that, that, that is the thing, really. And he was the kind of, you know, the impetus for all kind of my other books, the kind of, if you like, the cornerstone, really. And so in Maggie's class, I was able to develop my character school when I'd actually started writing my novel, and it was such an achievement. And um, so Maggie set up her publishing house with Jane, and she rang me up and she said, look, we're doing an anthology of short stories. Can we have the first chapter of your book? Running hot. And I thought, yeah, that would be fine. I thought, yes, because I haven't had to go to an agent. A publisher has come to me. I know Maggie. This could really work out. I didn't have much of the story there, but I certainly had the first chapter and a couple of others. I gave her the first chapter, I polished it up. She came back the next week and said, my co-director, Jane, loved it so much. Can we publish the whole book? And that is how I got published. And you know what? I look back and I always go back to that incident with my friend and my friend saying to me, don't go there you will never get in. And if I had listened to her, I wouldn't have published my book. I wouldn't be standing here today. So we did this book, Running Hot, and I didn't even think of it as crime. I thought it was social commentary, someone caught up in the world they need to get out of. Somebody gives them seven days, a window of opportunity. Will they or won't they make it, particularly when they make a false move right at the beginning? And so we wrote this book, and I had such pleasure writing it. You know, you, I can see my grin now, because I had such pleasure writing it. And every writer will tell you, the writing of their first book, there's something very special about it. It's like you're very free. It's like it's a story you've thought of for a long time. It's the characters that you've really, really cared about. We published this book, and then what we started noticing was happening was it was starting to get reviewed. It was starting to get reviewed in the Telegraph, the Guardian. And you know, this is quite amazing for a small publishing house that produces six books a year from a house in Hackney. And before that, oh, I must tell you, when I went around to um, pick it up and you know, talking about success and feelings of elation not necessarily coming from money, and I went around with my sister Anastasia. Now, my sister Anastasia, I was her mates here today. My sister's a lot smaller than me, but she's a lot tougher than me. And we went around to my publisher's house, and we went in, and Maggie said, oh, here's the book. We took the book. We behaved very coolly. It's a shame I haven't got running on here. I would have brought one along. We behaved very coolly. We said, Maggie, that looks fantastic. Thank you very much, Maggie. We got back in the car, and we went, yes! And you know that, yes, you can't pay for money to go yes like that. This was an achievement. It wasn't just an achievement for me. It was an achievement for my whole family. My whole family. I must admit, my dad started reading it when he came across, because it is very reflective, the language of the world it's in. came across the first swear word. He was like, <laughs> you know. But my dad, I saw the chuckle on his face. That sense of um, real, real, real achievement. 
so it started to get reviewed, and then my um, publisher met a very well-known crime writer who said to her, I hope you're going to put this in for the CWA, which is a crime writer association, John Creasy Dagger Award, which is the best first-time crime novel in Britain. <coughs> I said, Maggie thought, oh yeah, we'll do that. So we popped it in. Because I hadn't thought about it as crime, but this crime writer said to me, no, of course it's crime. It's a chase thriller. Somebody's been chased through the streets of London. Will he or won't he make it? And um, then we heard it got shortlisted. And it was like, oh, hey, we can go to the award ceremony. Wow. Haven't been to one of those since prize giving at school. So we went off, and there were like 400 people there. Terry Pratchett was the guest of honour. Um, and it won. And it was just like an absolute shock, but a really satisfying shock, you know? And I think it validated the work that Maggie and her publishers have been doing from the house in Hackney. And I remember talking to one of the judges um, years on, and she said, we haven't really been reading that type of book in Britain so much about people who are involved in crime and kind of giving it its bigger societal um, context, really. And I then got picked up by an agent there, a really well-known agent, and I ended up at a bigger publisher, Hodder. But actually, also at the award ceremony was, um, I don't know if people know Mark Lawson. He does a lot of work on radio for BBC for Arts Reviewer. And he contacted me to say he wanted me to come on his show on Radio 4 called um, Front Row to talk about running what he'd read it, really liked it. And being from the East End, I thought, yeah, I'll have a good natter on the radio. Yeah, I'm, I'm up for that. So I went along, and we had a really, it was just fantastic. It was such a great time. I don't even see it as work. It was just such a great time. And then after that, Front Row started contacting me again. And they contacted me, would you mind coming on and reviewing the last Prime Suspect, Prime Suspect 5? And I thought, people are going to pay me for this. I love Prime Suspect. Yeah, I'll do that. And before I knew it, people were contacting me for my views. I've been on the telly, I write for The Guardian, The Observer. I, I've just got an opinion about mostly everything, you know? People are interested in the voices of people who come from inner cities, of the people who grew up in East London, who grew up on council estates. And it keeps making me go back and thinking about my friend. Don't go there. You will not get in. And if I'd listened to her, I would never have got to do all those things. And, you know, yeah, I don't get paid great. You know, BBC is not known as the greatest payer in the world. But, you know, here in terms of satisfaction, you can't beat it. And so Schoolboy was then the impetus for all the other books. So I then wrote Killer Tune, which is slightly different. This is a book very close to my heart because... What I started to realise in my community was a lot of the older people were either going back to um, the Caribbean, like my dad, or doing that and dying. And my dad passed away this year, so I was really pleased I wrote it. And it's a book set now, but also in 1976, and set in East London, and particularly in Hackney and, and Notting Hill. And then, and Schoolboy's in that one, and then I picked up not just Schoolboy's story, another character, Jackie's story, Jackie Jarvis. And I knew she had a backstory. What was Jackie's backstory? And I started to figure out her backstory is about having grown up in care for a time with some other girls and having to do criminal activities for a local gangster. And I started writing Geezer Girls. And then out of that popped another character, Daisy. And then out of this, I've come full circle with Hit Girls. And Hit Girls is my last book in my kind of East End books. And it's Schoolboy and Jackie's story, because they kind of get together. And in Hit Girls, Schoolboy and Jackie are really hugely successful people, which is what I wanted for them, but they're confronted with an absolute crisis. How are they going to deal with this? Are they going to go to the police for help, or are they going to go back to their ducking and diving ways? And that kind of is really kind of my story and the reason I write crime is because I think crime just is a fabulous somebody said to me don't say this because this is such a cliche but I do like this as an as a image it, it can be a real mirror to the world that we're living in and I love the image of a reflection and sometimes when you pick up crime books it tells you so much about the society that you're actually um, living in